thank uh, Jerry Anderson for helping arrange this location. And uh, Marcia Gibbs with the Sustainable Farming, uh, San Joaquin Sustainable Farming System, and uh, Dow, um, Chris? Andre. Andre, pardon me, I was thinking of somebody else. Andre with uh, Dow, who, who, who provided lunch for us. Thank you very much. Um, and so what we wanted, what I would like to get done today is everybody has a, a survey. If you don't have a survey and you grew up up and you want to answer it, please raise your hand. I want to give this to uh, you guys so you can see what we're talking about here. So I ask you to at least complete items one through three before you leave today. Turn that sheet off and then behind it you'll see uh, the, uh, the, the, the same questions on four are on the next two pages. So if you want to get more detail to me, by fax, that would be great. What we're trying to do here is try and, as they say in the media recently, we're not trying to connect the dots, we're trying to collect the dots. So we're looking to try and get information about where the problem was, were there commonalities between what you saw between the fields up here, how, how large was it, um, compared to say Button Willow Imperial Valley has been struck by it as well as uh, has Palo Verde Valley. And so we're trying to see what is it? Is it just happened to be, in my opinion, an aphid year? And that's our excuse. Or is there something more to it? Is it a change in our pesticide use pattern? Is it a change in the, uh, the way of, uh, the, the alfalfa plant is, is, uh, is, is demonstrating its uh, tolerance? Is it a change in the bug itself? Is it you know, something we brought onto ourselves? What is the, you know, what are the reasons? And if we can understand that, then what can we do to kind of prevent this or prepare for it next time? With the next time, we've got uh, uh, representatives from the California Alfalfa Forage Alliance or Association? Association. Association. Spencer there. And um, uh, they're going to be looking at the possibility of looking at Section 18s or even full registrations for products next year. Nothing's probably going to occur in time for us this year. but next year. So part of the reason to collect data here is so we can get an understanding of what may be happening better by getting as much data together, as well as to understand what the economic loss was and what the efficacy of those products were. So this is all going to lead to building a stronger case for Section 18 uh, or even a Section 3 on some other products uh, for the association carried forward to EPA and, uh, and Cal EPA. So this is why it's really important uh, to, to, to provide us some information, if not today, uh, when, when, when you start collecting bales from the next cutting and go, oh, wait a minute, this is down by a, sub a substantial amount. We need to know that so that we can feed that into the economic uh, loss part of the whole thing. So before we get started too far into personal observations, Larry, you guys did a really good job of, of kind of talking just generally about the about alpha aphid, kind of get us maybe on the same page, then we can uh, we can start talking about what we all individually have. Yeah, no computers, so it's going to be short. Keep the applause sure uh, The two questions I've gotten the most are uh, you know, what caused this and what are you doing about it? And unfortunately, I don't have the answers to either one of those questions. So, uh, again, that indicates it's probably going to be pretty short. So, you know, blue alfalfa aphid uh, is a, a pest that was first found in California in 1974 around Bakersfield. Fern Crawford, uh, PCA down in Bakersfield yesterday, you know, told us a story about fields where it was first found and everything, so uh, he gave us a historical perspective on it. But it's in 74 and then in Pearl Valley in 75, so it spread very quickly uh, throughout, the, throughout the valley. Uh, within a year, it was really throughout the west, uh, Idaho, et cetera, uh, in the 70s. Um, one of the key ways that we've managed this pest throughout the years has been host plant resistance. So alfalfa varieties uh, have varying levels of resistance to aphids and, and there's that chart that reads the resistance when you pick your variety and, and uh, you're highly resistant, moderately resistant or whatever. And blue alfalfa aphid is one of those, those, key, uh, those key pests on that, on that chart. So in 1975, some of the first evaluations for host plant resistance started against blue alfalfa aphid. So basically the year after it was found, you know, researchers uh, jumped on it and tried to look at, at, at alfalfa varieties. And in 1977, Cup 101 was made available and found to be 55% resistant to blue alfalfa. So that was the best they had at the time, but it, it, beat, it beat nothing. 
and uh, UC 102 was 45% resistant. I don't know what happened to UC 102, Dan. You know that one? <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> Wasn't that good? <laughs> and then other resistant varieties were developed in uh, Oklahoma and Texas and UC um, 195 was developed, and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, as, as Pete mentioned, you know, what, what caused this? Is it just an aphid year? Just the weather conditions? Uh, I don't know, can we document the weather's been unusual this, this spring? Uh, kind of winter, I don't know. That's a possibility. You know, another possibility of, of what brought this on is uh, insecticide resistance. I mean, um, as we know, with, with any insect that you can think of, if you use insecticides against it, eventually it's going to overcome those insecticides and develop resistance. I don't think there's a, an insecticide or an insect that that won't happen eventually. I mean, you like to develop insecticides and say they'll be around for 50 years and still be effective, but that's not reality. It, it does happen. Uh, Avas in particular uh, develop resistance to insecticides, so that could be what's going on. We, we don't know. There's some some data been been. Uh, uh, developed this spring in, in that area, but I think there's still some questions out there. Then the other reality is with host mite resistance, you know, the plant is controlling the insect. So what does the insect do? Well, the insect evolves. You know, insects, uh, uh, that's what they do. They don't just stay put and remain unchanged. They evolve. So they eventually adapt to the host mite resistance and overcome their host mite resistance. So just like Insecticides, they overcome the insecticide, eventually they overcome the host mite resistance. So what do you have to do? Well, the plant breeder then has to tweak the host mite resistance and make it better, make it stronger, make it different. And that'll work for, for a few years. So there are examples of insects, uh, not blue up alpha even necessarily, but examples of insects uh, in small grains where the plant breeders develop a resistant wheat variety. It works for about three years. They've already developed the next one, have their back pocket. As soon as the first one fails, they introduce the next wheat variety. And they just keep trying to stay a step ahead of the, uh, of the aphid. So in a sense, you might say, you know, if this is what's going on, we've been pretty lucky that we've had effective most of resistance for about <coughs> what, 40 years. And if it is starting to break down now, which we don't have any evidence that's the case, but I'm just pulling things out of the, out of the sky. Um, if that's starting to break down, you know, some people might say, well, it's about time, or it's already past time. So we need to work on getting uh, improved resistance. Um, I guess that's basically what I've got to say. I'm kind of, kind of rambling here. So we you don't exactly know uh, what's, what's going on. We don't have any proof about what's going on, but just based on what we know about aphids and what we know about insect, these, those are just some, uh, some theories that, that could be tossed out there. One thing with the host plant resistance that, that we have in alfalfa is that it's not very effective under cool weather conditions. Uh, we've, we've known that for years, so if the temperatures are about uh, 70, 72 degrees, and that's on a 24 hour average, um, the alfalfa grows fine, the resistance is there, but it's just not at a high level. It, that's just because of the low temperature. And that's why every spring, you know, we always have a few blue alfalfa, especially down in Kern County. But once it gets hot, you know, once we get those 80 degree, 85 degree averages, the host mite resistance kicks up to high level. And that coupled with the high temperature, which the aphid doesn't like, knocks the aphids down. So I wrote a thing for the alfalfa blog that some of you may have seen. It was on in Farm Press too, that you know, my idea was once it gets hot, uh, the, the resistance in the plant is going to kick up to a high level and the problem is going to go away. Well, hasn't happened yet, but <laughs> that, was, that was one theory. Um, but that is you know, what's known about that, about that resistance. So, anybody have any questions or comments? On uh, the resistance in the plant, once they develop that in, in that variety, how many generations out does that go that that's those resistances are still good? So you got a variety that was in one of the alfalfa uh, charts 10 years ago and the guy's planting it. Do they, is it supposed to stay the same all the way through? Yeah, should stay the same. We've got, by the way, we've got, uh, we've got Dan Putnam who's the alfalfa, statewide alfalfa specialist and a alfalfa breeder. 
that can uh, answer some of these questions too. So Dan, feel free to. Yeah, I was going to make a, a couple more comments. Uh, um, I think most of you are PCAs, right? Um, so the question, one of the questions I have is, how many of you make recommendations to your growers to purchase seed that definitely has a high level of resistance to blue alfalfa aphid or to other aphids? Yeah. So, so I think you know. So there's two things. There's two things. One is that the seed companies need to uh, hear from the industry that this is a high priority, and so they need, uh, in order to make sure that they maintain a high level of resistance in the lines that they're continually releasing. To answer your question, if a line has been released and planted five years ago at a certain level of resistance, it should remain at that level of resistance. Um, uh, but keep in mind that resistance is always qualitative. It's never 100%. It's, it's a percentage of the plants that are affected by the, by the bug. But I just looked up the uh, listing. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the uh, listing of varieties that uh, National Alfalfa and Forge Alliance publishes? So you should have a, a copy of that download or print it out or order their 25 cents, I think, if you order them. But uh, you can download it and print it out and put it in your notebook or put it in your pickup truck and have it available. So, you know, it's really one of the major uh, techniques we have. But I notice that there are quite a few varieties that do not have a high level of resistance. And if nobody pays attention to this, then they will plant a variety that actually is pretty susceptible or has an unknown level of resistance. So this is the kind of thing that we have to push for. And when it comes to the fall planting, I think we should really make sure that we have a high level of uh, blue alfalfa aphid resistance as well as some of the other aphids. If one of the little boxes is not checked for PA aphid or uh, spot alfalfa aphid, does that mean there's no resistance? Or well, do you just I, I think it? It's, it probably means that it tested tested uh, either susceptible or or that uh, they decided that not to, to include the test. I mean, they, they can decide not to include a test. Uh, I um, just let one of my growers know, know this morning after I found in his variety that it didn't have pink chicks. He was not happy. Yeah. Well, and, and see, part of this feedback has to go to the companies then so that the companies hear from the industry that blue alfalfa aphid, we need to maintain a high level of aphid resistance there because uh, the companies otherwise will not pay as much attention to it. And we haven't had a problem with blue alfalfa around here in 30 years ago. Yeah, I've never so, seen you know, that kind of right. us off guard also. Yeah. So we didn't even know there was a problem. Yeah. Well, they've had more of a problem in the su further south from here. I mean, Imperial Valley, it, it comes up every several years. Uh, but, but this has been a particularly bad year. And, I'm waiting for the entomologist to explain it all to us, but <laughs> yeah, I think there's, I mean, the other option, which I didn't mention, but will be something has changed with biological control. You know, we're just throwing, throwing ideas out and see what sticks here, but, you know, I mean, there are uh, obviously a number of insects that feed on aphids. There are uh, uh, disease organisms that infect and kill aphids. So has something changed with biological control? Yeah, I haven't noticed any change. I don't know of any change. I'm but, yeah, but one of the things we're, what's, what's a real mystery is is that it's it's so localized. It's not only really localized that it's you know just a dust pile, so nothing really all the way down until you get to Button Willow, two and a half hours south. But within Dos Palos, there are fields and there are not fields. There are places and there are not places. You know? Pete, there we also another localized area that we've had problems here in the last three years was that we've been using Warrior almost exclusively side exclusively on the weevils. And then a couple of years ago, it started not working very well. Last year was a total disaster. So this year, I, I didn't use hardly any warrior. Everything went from uh -huh. Laura's band or uh, uh, Stuart with Dimethylate. And oddly enough, the Stuart Dimethylate, we were worried about firing up the aphid with those materials, and those turned out to be the fields that we didn't get the blue out of the aphid problem. So there was a change of materials, but they were there before you even started changing. That's true. Yeah, and and if you look at uh, what the folks are saying down about Willow, they're using this. Uh, they're using the same kinds of uh, insecticide use patterns on the fields they have problems on, and the fields they don't have problems on. So it doesn't. It, it, so yeah, that's the whole confusing thing about it. Um, one pattern I see is where I sprayed earlier with lambicide or warrior and uh, on both and they cut before the rain. Every one of those fields have severe problems. Hmm. 
Yeah. My worst fields were the ones that cut early, yeah. but I got a guy not even a quarter mile away. He cut 10 fields at the exact same time. He's not sprayed one time for the head of it. So the same thing. Jeez. So, so every time we get a pattern, something screws it up. So that's Warrior. And Warrior and Alpine. And then a cut early. An early cut before the rain. Uh, every one of those fields. Okay. Now if, afterwards, after the rain, and the spray, we will say mixes. We cleaned up all okay. the yeah, I spread all my stuff late and I really didn't have a real big problem until later. I mean, I just, Monday just had to spray for the field. And you made me work. And I was like, because they were, they were, they had aphids in them on a low level, so we just went ahead and cut them. And then, then it got hot, so I figured, okay, it's going to get hot, they're going to go away. And I was checking them last week, two weeks ago. They were still in there, but lots of lady beetles. I thought, okay, it's hot, so we got lady beetles fine. This last week I went in there, there were more aphids there. I mean, my bag was full of them. Yeah, that happened. And then were these blue or pink? They were blue. The blue variety. I don't so know the variety, variety. Yeah. A lot of that could be the variety. Well, that's why this, what you have in front of you is so important. You yeah. can take this real because quick on the last two pages. If you could, you may not have the information right now, but if you could sort of look at one or two examples of your worst fields and kind of fill out what variety it was, the agent stand, bale to green chop, cutting intervals, when did you notice the outbreak, rate the nat natural enemy, this kind of stuff. If you could get that back to me on one or two of your just worst fields that you had, then maybe a pattern could emerge from this thing. I don't know. Uh, so I encourage everybody to do so. What was the name of that website that had their list? Yeah, it, it's alfalfa.org, um, and, and it's a national Alfalfa and Forage Alliance that has a book, a, a, a publication they publish every year with the current varieties that are available for sale. And they have all the listings of the uh, pest resistance ratings. How many people here actually got onto the Alfalfa and Forage blog? There you go. So already we're 100% more than Bud Willow was. <laughs> Use more computers up here, I can tell. Because that's just something that Dan and Shannon Mueller have been working hard to put together. And this is where we've been reporting, uh, you know, as we see things, it just, we'll just throw something in there. And uh, you can find that just by, 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 by uh, searching or Googling. Um, alfalfa alfalfa blog. I'd say alfalfa work group. Dot, uh, uh, well, you can, you can actually Google alfalfa blog and it comes up. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to get over your alfalfa website for all that information. But yeah, uh, yeah it's, 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 it's where a lot of the current stuff we're trying to keep in going. I think um, several of the cultivars have good resistance, according to that chart, for blue alfalfa aphid and for spotted alfalfa aphid. For pea aphid, it's, uh, I think, not quite as uh, widespread. And then for uh, cow pea aphid, which is a new one that we came up with about There's no, almost six, no eight years ago, I don't think it's even rated on there. So we don't know that cow pea aphid. I've been trying to breed for it, but they, they haven't come out with varieties yet. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting with spotted aphid, which generally don't have too bad here for the hot weather. I mean, it likes the hot weather. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with that one down in current down here. On that, on that blog, says the calcium it, it appears to me it's saying it's not that bad. But around here, if we had calcium aphid as bad as we had this blue, Oh, we have yeah. some mate because oh, they oh, seem yeah. to stunt the oh, yeah. quick. No, you're absolutely right. I think they're talking about it right now it seems to be found in lower populations. Is that yeah. just that it hadn't really been seen there before, I think is what they we've got a we've got a physiologist here, so we can ask the question we couldn't ask yesterday. I don't think we could get a good answer yesterday in Button Willow, is how long does this you know the, the, the aphid is injecting a feeding toxin, it stunts that growth. We cut it, pull it off, will the plants recover from the next cutting? Is it multiple years or multiple cuttings? We know? Some of it doesn't recover. My, my, my thinking is that it, it lasts at least another cutting after. Another cutting, yeah. At least another cutting after the damage has been done from the first cutting. But I don't know if I have any good scientific evidence for that, just observations. Mm -hmm. Was this, is the toxicity throughout the whole plant all the way to the roots? Or is it just like well, part? it's, I'm not sure. About that, but it, you know, we've we've observed you know heavily infested fields that, that actually really have a hard time the next cutting. So well, where all the windrows are, yeah. are, yeah, yeah. But the other thing that we noticed yesterday, we looked at some fields yesterday after our meeting, and it was a windrow. You can see the windrow pattern, 
And one of the things that we noticed was, or one of the things we observed was that how much is, is the carryover of the toxin and how much is the reduced root system and the reserves to put out of the flux. So, you know, Vernon Crawford again was saying that he had a grower that wouldn't spread, wouldn't spread them years and years ago. And they sheeped it, and then they bailed it, and they cut it, did all sorts of things. And within a year of that first, it's a one-year field, and by the second year, it was gone. And it basically had burned out every reserve that it had because it never got a chance to recover. And so it's a combination. I mean, it could well be a combination of the fact that there is a res reservoir of this toxin. And second, it's just a weaker, weaker plant. Um, well, we didn't know whether to cut or water it again and then cut or... Well, you and, and Robert were talking. You did one way, he did the other. Who won? <laughs> you watered, he cut. Who won? It wasn't the grower. <laughs> <laughs> cut that one. I know. Keep, Where I showed you, they still haven't cut. Yeah. Well, you said they're going to be. They're going to water once more every two weeks or so. But where they did cut, uh, the beneficials cleaned up the stubble. So we're waiting to see how it washes up. But, you know, just got here and here. Some, some of them, they, they just let the weed go, the ladybugs go, and they clean them up in a two, three days. And then some of them come back and you get 40, 50 ladybug larvae in your net, and there's so many aphid, you waited six, seven, eight days, you got to spray. Yeah. Even with all those, they're just not taking them out. We saw a lot of ladybugs yesterday in those fields. We saw a lot of the uh, parasitism, you know, a lot of the mummies. And the fungus killed. Uh, but yeah, still a lot of aphids were there. But I have one more question. When, how did the aphid know when to start having weaned aphids? Yeah. Is it after it, it gets so crowded? Yeah, when they get crowded or when the plant quality goes down. So they know. And I gotta go, I gotta get out of here, get to a new, new neighborhood. So there's a pharaoh or something? It's like four wings and, and Yeah, and bear in mind that this has a very short life cycle and it's it's asexual. So that when you see that tiniest little aphid coming out, the granddaughter's already inside of her. Right. So you've got this really telescoped. So I imagine it, it might be that daughter, granddaughter already in that aphid that's saying this is getting crowded, we need to you know, I don't know, but it's it's well, really the fields that we sprayed. I think we thought that we weren't killing them, but I would go back and what I started noticing is I think we killed most of them, but we got a net full of wing day. They were coming back in again, just yeah. so you know we're in the air. Well, this is a publication from 1975 when it first hit. It's in my files. It was in files that I inherited. <laughs> Did you write this one? It's actually on parchment. It's under blue elf alpha, but that's not a But these things we're talking about, exactly the same thing that you know, they say. You know, insecticides work, but then the wing David's moved in and made it look like it didn't work. Um, yeah. They're also talking about contributing to high worm populations during the summer because of the green. That's all you need, right? <laughs> No, that's one of the things where, yeah, that's one of the things we got to be really careful about is, is not opening ourselves up to everything else because we're, because the more we talk about this, the more people read the blog, the more frightened they get. And now there's, there's a lot of treatments for aphids that are more, going on. More spray going on, yeah. So it's one of the things we have to be a little careful about. But the, how is it looking now? Is it still, is there still people complaining of the problem? I'm pretty sure that the three feels like starting to get really sticky and picky. Everything else is clean. And you treated it, took care of it? Basically, I, I haven't had any of this. I'm what are you doing here? Right <laughs> right away. Let me. <laughs> Fireball. Lord's band amount of time. You get a fair job on the aphid. Knock them down. You saw these. Right. Yeah. And then the weevil, we didn't get a good knockdown, but we got residual out of it. They, we didn't get any higher counts. They were 10 to 30. We let them go. They ate them up a little bit, and we cut them. One field, second year field, the aphid built up. And I don't know if it's blue, alfalfa aphid or not. See, that's because I didn't hear about this. And then I'm, you know, I'm not, yeah, that's aphid. But that ladybug moved in and cleaned them up. Okay, that's fireball. And I haven't seen any stunting or stripping. And then here I used Stewart and Malathion, and it did a great job. And then my first year fields, which were big, they were planted in October. And they had heavy aphid, and a couple of fields got eaten up by a little bit. But we let them, we did not treat them. 
didn't treat them. And we cut them. And uh, before the cutting, they were cleaned up by ladybugs. They were they were gone. And now they're all they're all clean and nothing's going on in about I don't know uh, 25, 3,000 acres. But I, I think it's a lot to do with the variety. You know, a lot of that might be the variety. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, what is the resistance? Most of my alfalfa, I never saw a lot of stunted. What I had was just drippy, sticky, I messy. Know. I had some of that, and then it, we got that rain. Right. And it washed it, it cleaned them up, and then the, the ladybugs cleaned it. There was I, I, have a, I have a question about the variety issue. Does anybody know of fields that have resistant lines that you still see a high level of, of uh, blue alcohol? I had, I had them until two days ago and I sprayed. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and there's a variety that you knew was resistant, right? It's, it wasn't. Uh, it's around the No, it was. Uh, was it around a ready roundup? Well, around the ready roundup. Yeah, it was around the No, no, it wasn't around the ready roundup. It was. Uh, it was used if you tell me the name of the variety, I've got my American, American worst state 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 What's the America's varieties? America's state alfalfa? Yeah. Yeah, America. Was it called dormancy eight or nine? Ameristan, is it Ameristan? 901 or something? Yeah, it was the eight. 901. 801S and 802. Oh, 801 and 802? Yeah. I'll look it up. Oh, 803. Oh, they didn't list it. It, I had to go back to that uh, 2001 on the two edition. Finder. One of the one of the difficulties of this lifting, listing is that uh, they charge $100 to list. So if they have an older variety, they don't list it anymore. 803, 803T. No, mine was 801S and 802 that they, they blended with. 801S. That's probably a fall dormancy eight. So. Yeah. Um, they loaded up. They loaded up. They, they came in when the hay was stronger and loaded up really heavy. And then they cleaned up before they cut it. They were yellow. But all my heavy aphid fields were around up right All of your heavy aphid fields were around up right there. A lot of ladybugs cleaned them up. Yeah. But the ladybugs were able to clean them up. Go ahead. Okay. The only fields that I had that got injured that actually got stuck in and uh, didn't go from there. Uh, uh, the both varieties that don't have a breed, they were just blank. They were all dormancy rating of six. There's less resistance in those medium dormancy levels. What did that mean? I did have populations of some other fields. I don't think I sprayed any side of those two varieties. And most of the other are fine. But if I did spray, one thing that I did notice is that this field was great for the aphids. This one was not. The lady fields were really late to naturally they come back into those fields. And, uh, so they didn't really have a chance to contribute you know, after the spray of contributes to the control. Did you generally see about the same kind of natural enemy presence? Yeah, and nothing out of the ordinary, but you said they came like back on a reef you know, on that particular field. Bud Will said that they seemed to see some of their fields, they weren't noticing any labor here at a time they usually see them. So first cutting had nothing, second cutting is when they finally started to arrive under high populations. Do you have any uh, variety tests, Dan, that would be a location for uh, Yeah, um, we, have, we have one in Westside Field Station, and we have another one at Kearney. Um, I'll have to see. We usually try to spray, you know, the insects and, and keep them under control. But, um, and, and that's a little bit of an isolated area in some of those areas. So, I've been looking at both the organic and the conventional field and I'll follow You don't see too much. And there was no way for whatsoever. Yeah. I mean, just a tiny, tiny. Get us back to this patchiness that you're seeing, even. No, there was not even. I mean, I've, I've seen these fields. They're, you'd have to be blind and not. You, you trip over the aphid. There's so many there. This was. It's very clean in that. And I, yeah. Um, to Larry hasn't reported. They're going right directly to the dairies. And they really. And guys in Butler said the same thing that when they 
They green chopped and moved it out, even with the aphid problem more or less disappeared because it didn't have a chance to get in the stubble. So that's a pretty obvious, you know, hmm. correlation. Yeah, we had a lot of pea aphids on the Davis campus, but very few blue up off it. Maybe 1% blue up Has anybody estimated the acreage that is damaged in the state? Is it 10%? Or so you're here today. <laughs> um, yeah. Now I talked to him because we were talking to the guys down there, saying, "Well, what do you think it is?" And, and you know, in terms of that, almost everybody, although it sounds really horrible, most guys will say, "Well, it's a field here, it's a field there." It tends to be. What did one guy say yesterday? It tends to be a ranch, but not an area. So a ranch has it, but the next ranch doesn't. As opposed to two fields in one ranch, two fields in the other ranch. Um, I know one guy was telling me that sounds he, pretty typical of here too. Yeah, that's really strange. Because you think if particularly being formed, they would be coming through and just who cares who the owner is? In my is. case, I'd say it's about um, 25 percent of my thought flavor. Okay. Yes. Yeah. One, one ranch doesn't have any, and the other one is just partial. Does a does a does a, a farmer or grower always grow the same variety on the ranch, or, or are they going to mix varieties? Do we know? I mean, do they say one well, mile? Well, yeah, it depends when you plant. If you planted it, split plantings, you might plant different varieties. But if you're planting the whole place, you're going to put the same variety. And then next year, you take you know, there's a field that goes out. You might replant, or, so that might be a different variety. So it's not necessarily 100 percent across because they're always different ages. Right. But you're going to keep your for irrigation for yeah, right. they try to keep it the same. Are they using the same pesticides? Concurrent for weevil? Yeah. yeah. Stewart, Warrior, Band. Oh, you know what? And since then, they've, uh, about it. they've been banging it like crazy with Lanny. They've gone through a lot of Lanny for the aphid. Well, I just started using Lanny with the method. And it didn't even kill them all either. But uh, well, what I did notice, did a good job on the aphid. <laughs> <laughs> but it left them the uh, the uh, box. Huh? Left the wasps. Uh, there's right Scott, me, just your nets full of little wasps. Well, they might have been protecting their mummies. So they, when they, they came out, and then when they came out, it was you know they were alive, but they may yeah, so they didn't last long. Yeah. Yeah, they're uh, but they're getting. To, but even then, there's still there's still a lot of fields we talk about down there. But they, what yeah. they're cutting the problems. There's one other thing I don't know if that is, the wind. We have had. Day after day after day of wind, and that's blowing the wind as well. And I also think that it kept the plants a lot drier, but the bugs didn't work as well. Well, it's been dry and it's been warm since this morning. Yeah, but yeah. it's been dry and dry. Yeah, when we start spraying it's some the of these stuff, we had 70 degrees. It's the driest, January, the driest five month period in history this year, hmm. January through April. That, that uh, issue about wind did come up with the argument that. Specifically, with the aerial applications, the wind <coughs> issues. Um, you know that I'm spraying during hot uh, wind in the aerial application, but uh, it seemed like wind was, a, was an issue as far as the performance of that specific application. So well, it's a pain, I think. I think the ground would do something about it. The dryness, <laughs> you could do something about the fungus disease. That have also allowed a higher population to get started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. It could, yeah. And we're battling more the fungus was not so bigger numbers to deal with. Yeah, well, you know, the other thing too, I think uh, Alistair, we talked quite a bit about this, but well, it's about the numbers game. And I think this has to do with what you saw last year with your weevil. If you've got 100 weevil per sweep and you're still 90 percent, or 150 per sweep and you're still you're 80 percent effective on your pesticide application, which is what you expect, perhaps you're left with enough that are over the threshold. It's the same thing here. If you're 95 percent with what did Vern use? A ton and a half of weevils or something? You know, you're, 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 you just can't seem to beat that thing down. And then of course you're right back into beneficial insects, etc. So it you know it does come out to be a numbers game of time too. There were some samples taken from some of your fields and brought back to Alice. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, it's part of what, what I wanted to report on was 
uh, Bob and Jerry kind of gave me the access to a couple of fields because there was um, uh, concern about uh, performance of the pesticide applications that we weren't knocking down the populations and maybe the, the insecticides were losing efficacy or something. So we did a test with uh, a po couple of populations, uh, corner of Brinko and Laguna and uh, Maryland Evans. So we got uh, some samples, Jerry and then Bob had the access there. And, uh, took those alfalfa back and we, we dipped them in very dilute solutions of laws band. One ounce to a hundred gallon dilution. So a very, very dilute solution. So a one to 320 dilution of a typical field rate. And we go basically between uh, 100 to 89% uh, uh, mortality uh, with the laws band. So, and these were from populations in the area that were affected. So, kind of indicated that the, the populations were still as susceptible to chlorpyrifos as they were, so it wasn't in the case that maybe there wasn't a lot of resistance to that. So it may just be something, and that's where we came up with the, kind of the numbers game kind of theory. And we still have an effect of insecticide, but we're only bringing it down 90%, and those numbers were still so high that we can just push back up very quickly. So one of the ideas that came up was um, the, the flyers. Yeah. But again, we only tested one in single side, so we didn't cover all scenarios. But uh, and, and it was with populations that were collected from this area. So um, well, that makes a lot of sense to me. This number is big. I can see it in my field. Where they're bad, really bad. It's bad. Where where they're, where they're it's not. It's not. Yeah, like, you're only killing 80 percent, and you're still leaving that many behind. Okay, what's the answer to that? A higher rate, put more more poison out there to compensate for the extra population. Go a higher label, you know, like a section 18 or whatever, and go, you know, to double your rate or something like that. Is that is that the answer? Well, maybe not a rate, um, but coverage. So. Uh, because, like I said, we used very dilute rates. And what we did ensure was coverage, 100% coverage, because we dipped the alfalfa spring into the, into the solution. Well, what's the difference between brown rates or air? Uh, the fields that I took you to were yeah. 20 gallons of the acre of the ground. We brought at two pounds a quart of lower spring. Yeah, so the rate, yeah, I mean, weight, the rate was the size I could cover. Yeah. And the cover, 20 gallons, 20 pounds. Yeah. It wasn't very big. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. You see, so I mean, it is something unusual about either the population or the tolerance of the crop right now at the timing. Uh, something unusual. Um, but again, this was only one one insecticide. Uh, close same deal to me, like Bob said. The, the wind did coming in like it was just swarms. Just a yeah. uh -huh. have an observation on that CG that we have to comment on it. With the aphids in there and my weevils both, that was noticed for several years that we're spraying the field is kind of like a thin stand. A lot of uh there's dirt there, a lot of wood soil. Much more control than
going to be a little bit more resistance. Because I see the same thing. Hmm. Well, you know, I saw that when, when Warrior first came out. That's probably the first time I observed that Warrior was in the second year. And uh, that's the first time I observed that. Uh, or should I remember? So, yeah, they, they maybe had Warrior on it once or twice in the year prior. So. And Fred has a good way of identifying the blue off of the paper, too. And I think that would be right. Yeah. How they stick to the outside of the net now. Inside. Yeah, I mean, the inside of the net. They call when you off. sweep them, they right. seem to stay on you shake them. You shake them. The PA could go to the bottom, the blue A, but they hang on. <coughs> they hang on a little bit on the inside of the net. It's true. Yeah, it's true. <coughs> of course, the middle of the breath took back. It was my breath. He always makes it work. I think this question of mechanism is, is an important one as to w whether we're dealing with a population issue or an efficacy issue in, per in terms of our current insecticides. It's relevant to whether the industry should seek a Section 18 this coming year. And I guess I'd like to hear, you know, your views about, you know, what you're seeing in terms of efficacy. Is, is it important for us to look at alternative pesticides? Um, and, and uh, you know, I don't know if we have good data on that yet. I guess we're trying to generate it, right, Larry, it's at this point? In terms of uh, efficacy for the... For alternative pesticides. Yeah. Eric Natwick down in Girl Valley has a, apparently a test ongoing right now. looking at that to see some of the insecticides. Well, we've we been out of the country, so we haven't been able to talk with you. Yeah, not yet. No, it's not. It's not. We can't not use that. Well, we know with, with they're talking about Belief and transform, right? Right. right. Uh, as, as possible. We know that in other crops they work really well on aphids. I mean, that's, that's you know, that, how they're going to work. But these aphids, is, you know, we have to start looking at uh, Certainly the packages are there to include, uh, to include aphids. In, in but certainly there's no evidence, at least so far, of, of resistance to Lohr's ban or to another insecticide, at least we don't have evidence for that yet, correct? We've got a lack of control right. for whatever reason. Right. And I think that's important. I think the other thing is you have to remember in this area, you're on, you know, you're, really, you're faced all the time with impaired water systems and increased use and more use of Lohr's ban if that's the primary tool. Uh, or, it's not going to cut it. It's not going to cut it. Or the carbamate or yeah. the, or the pyrethroid. With the so, water issue, we can't just, if we're going to have aphid issues like this, we can't keep hitting them with no, that stuff. We're exactly going to right. them in the summer, they're going to come back to us. And, and uh, not to mention the resistance problem of right. really putting pressure on them. Yeah. There's a lack of effective controls. And most people have said, we heard it yesterday, that looks like there's good knockdown with most of the products. You know, even when you have a jillion aphids or whatever, we're going to describe it as, you know, there's good initial knockdown, but then three days later, uh, you know, because of flyers and the ones that are left, the back when you started from it. So, I mean, the resistance, I mean, there could be resistance to knock down, which doesn't appear to be the case. There could be resistance more in terms of residual, and that, based on observations, appears to be the case for some, not getting residual control. But there's no scientific evidence. Seems to me the population, the population idea, seems to hold the greatest. Uh, you know, the combination between the population and the fecundity is the other thing. Is that these these critters just uh, replicate so rapidly? So you have that issue. So I mean, I to me that seems a little bit more compelling now as kind of an explanation. You know, we just have very high numbers for reasons that we don't understand very well. But but you know, this and fecundity local. thing. Pardon? And very localized. And much you know this. Actually, that's the other part that's that's interesting is, you know, why is it so localized like that? You can imagine, you know, Palo Verde, Imperial, and then now in Kern County. Okay, those are southern. It's kind of a, but even in Kern County, you go south of Button Willow, there's not a problem. You go north of Button Willow, there's not a problem. I've got two roads that are right next to each other. There's a line on the road. Everything off the road. You got everything south of the road. Oh. <laughs> I don't know, it's, it's in that kind of situation, but in that situation, we, it seems to be we could kind of narrow down the, the culprits, whether it's a variety issue yeah, or, or I like, you know, some of the comments about early spray, early cut. 
that leads, you saw more of an evidence in that case, is that, am I interpreting that correctly? If somebody sprayed early with pyrethroids and then they cut early, you had more severe problems, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Cut right. early but before rain. Before rain, they also have something to do with it as well. So that, that was kind of a clue there, I think, and I'm not sure exactly what's going on there. Larry, maybe you, or Pete, maybe you have some ideas. Is that, a, is that an effect on beneficial populations or? I think the idea is that if you cut early, like I had some cut that was still uh, not to last week of March. So then that stub was there, especially on these more dormant type varieties, they, they couldn't grow. So you took the aphids of your you know, standing hay, threw them on the windrow, and, and then it's cool and it's, it, they cut it too early, so it wasn't really ready to start growing that. And uh, also the fields that got injured that that stubble there, I mean the uh, windrow there for a week. So how much long would the windrow be there on an early cool cutting as opposed to later? Oh, a long time. Three, four, five days. It takes a while. And some of that rain, though, so it was forever. Yeah, I Might have been seven or eight days. days. How many days? Fifteen days of laid in there, and they had to go up, and then wherever those windrows were, it was just this big, and the rest is... That, he's talking about my field. It was all down. <laughs> and it had it before we even cut. Well, this was another thing. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it was this tall yes. before we cut it, but if you could have stood it up, but it was all laying down. Yeah. And that's another a, a, a mess, and a very poor cutting job because of the way it was so down. So there was a lot of uh, torn, torn, yeah. and, and, and leaves left, you know, leafy growth left behind it by the, by the swaffer, too. Instead, instead of having stubble like this, you might have this long stubble that's right. laying right. down. So you've got all this stuff laying out there for, the, for them to stay. Yeah, that's a good point too. Mm -hmm. Right, where we we'll said that, that was second year. But my first year, it was cut pretty clean. And what was after the rain also, then not a problem. Right, So, Larry, what's the answer? That was passed on really nicely. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a One of the questions, I mean, is there a need, and this is for CAFA people, for the California Alfalfa and Forage Association, to ask them to move on looking for a Section 18 or approval of different kinds of uh, solutions depending upon, I mean, is there a need for that? It would be nice if we had something other than an organic phosphate that's for sure. Okay. Mount Pine is not working. The, uh, the large band, if it's really cool, is not going to work as well. And then you get dimethylate. I mean, yeah, we get, that's all organic phosphate. We need some more weevils first. Yeah. Yeah. Stewart is about the only thing that works up here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and that's going to get, get used up pretty fast, too, if Stewart's the only thing that's. Yeah. We've got the water issues. Well, the chlorpyrifos is under such pressure. Yeah. 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 And we can't use lower than around here anyway unless we do it by ground. And if we go by ground, we still get in trouble. We still get in the levers. Is that because of the water issue? The water yeah. Yeah. drainage. So we're down to Dunnithwood and Lanning. Yeah, the weevil problem with high reports not working extends from here all the way up through uh, through Woodland. Oh, really? Dixon, in Slum County. Not just the wire, other, other pyre reports too. Yeah. Not just the wire, other pyre reports too. Other pyre reports. How many other pyre reports are registered besides Dave? Dave. There wasn't any. 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 There See what the next cutting. I was going to say, so if people, so if you, if you see that he normally gets X number of tons per acre, now he's getting X minus Y, you're going to hear about that as well, because that's the kind of stuff we need to sort of jot down somewhere and yeah, say. Yeah, the second cutting can be heard on those fields. Right? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. What's your, what's your plan on when you need these? Ten days? Two weeks? Yeah, it's, it's just going to be built in and sent down to, you know, in, in preparation for what the uh, CAFA and CAP is going to help us do. So it's not really time critical beyond the fact that it's as fresh in your mind as it can be. Uh, it would be great. 
Um, Dan brought up another thing that I didn't put on that. If you want to make a note on it, just make it. You know, I guess if you give me the variety, we can go back and figure out what the dormancy rating is. So that's fine. Yeah, if you can give me variety, we can figure everything out from that. Okay. Because I didn't think about dormancy, dormancy rating as a, as a fact. But, uh, yeah, because people are planning fall dormancy. You're, you're a sixes? Yeah, because there's... Got injured or six, and some other fields, and, and those rides don't have any weight, so I assume that the test Okay. Well, they don't. They don't. The seed companies don't consider that it's important to include this P, this aphid resistance in those sixes because they're marketing them to different areas of the country, and so this is part of the interaction that we need to get back to the seed companies and tell them, oh yeah, you know, it's important because we're planting those sixes here in California, and we're planting quite a few of the fours, fours, fives, and sixes up towards the delta there, and and all the way through this area. It's for quality, right? They're planning it for quality, usually. I just have a couple of growers that they prefer that. I don't yeah. know if they think that expand longevity is well, better. Well, I, I think it's because of, usually they're planting those low dormancy groups because of qual, uh, quality issues. They want they, they probably get a little higher quality with the fall dormancy six. But if they don't have the uh, aphid resistance pack, there are a few varieties that do have aphid resistance in this fives and sixes, but there's not many, very many of them. And sometimes they probably don't even just test for them because they don't think that people think they're important. So. Jerry, didn't you tell me that the, the rep for the seed company so that's supposed to be an attitude? I've never seen it before. I've never seen 